The stars in Hollywood found 1982 a year of change at the movies. While people spent more money at the box office than ever, and ticket sales reached a 21-year high, movie studios were facing challenges from all sides, cable TV, video discs, and home video games. Among the action-adventure films in 1982, one wasn't a box office smash, but it did offer a dazzling glimpse into a whole new visual landscape created by computers. It was the film Tron. Hey, hey, it's the big master control program everybody's been talking about. Stop. I'm warning you. I'm gonna have to put you on the game grid. <laughs> Some of the most successful films in the tough times of 82 were comedies. And there were a number of fine, intimate, little films. One surprise smash hit, an old-fashioned love story, starring Richard Gere and Deborah Winger. The film, An Officer and a Gentleman. My father's a rear admiral, 7th Fleet. You're kidding. No, no we, we lived in ports all over the world. Kathmandu, Moscow, Nairobi. Really? God, I've never been out of Washington. Wait a minute. You're kidding me, right? We don't have any naval bases in Moscow. No. I don't think so. So, uh, you got a girl mail in the water? No. I ain't looking for one either. What are you looking for? Among all the fantasy films, all the movies made for family entertainment, among all the films of the year, one broke every record in 1982. Steven Spielberg's E.T., The Extraterrestrial. of people wanted to keep E.T. in 1982. The wrinkled 800-year-old alien rekindled a childlike sense of wonder and an insatiable appetite for more. But while we wonder and wait for a sequel, there were plenty of the little spacemen to go around. Hey, Mr. Spaceman, won't you please take me along? I won't do anything wrong. Hey, the merchandiser's Mr. dream, E.T. showed up in every imaginable form, from T-shirts to video games and bicycles. He hawked his favorite candy and even made a surprise visit to the Hollywood Bowl. As E.T. took a bow, his multi-million dollar bank account was going into orbit. The lines grew and grew until one out of every ten workers was without a job, the highest unemployment since the Great Depression. Businesses failed at the rate of 500 a week, and home foreclosures set a new record. In 1982, camps called Reagan Ranches appeared as reminders of 1930s Hooverville. In some ways, the year began to look like a grim 30s rerun. Without homes of their own, many were forced to move their families into less permanent quarters. 
By the end of 82, no one really knew where Reaganomics might lead, forward to economic recovery or back to a new Great Depression. But President Reagan asked us to stay the course and continued to smile. June 21st, the most famous birthday of 1982. For loyal Britons everywhere, it was a time of anticipation. For nine months, everyone seemed to have advice for the expectant father. I've been flooded, literally, with books on how to be a pregnant father. <laughs> amongst all sorts of other things. Which has enabled me to become an amateur gynecologist. Fewer than 24 hours after the birth of their son, 33-year-old Prince Charles and 20-year-old Princess Diana took their baby home. One month later, they posed as a royal threesome. At his christening, the little prince became William Arthur Philip Louis. Like any other baby, William got fussy, and like any other mother, Diana knew just what to do. August 8th, a dark day in the continuing conflict in the Middle East. Beirut, once the Paris of the Middle East, in the summer of 82, a city under siege. On June 6th, 20,000 Israeli soldiers roll into southern Lebanon. The approval was given by Prime Minister Menachem Begin. His goal? destroy the power of Yasser Arafat's ELO. On August 8th, Israel begins its heaviest bombardment. The toll is heavy. More than 10,000 are dead. Another 70 to 80,000 are homeless. Pounded into submission, Yasser Arafat looks for a way out. He agrees that the PLO will leave Lebanon. Within 12 days, 11,000 Palestinian guerrillas are gone. Left behind, hundreds of thousands of Palestinian civilians under the protection of Israeli occupation troops. Then, on September 18th, the announcement of a terrible tragedy. Seeking revenge for the assassination of their new president, Christian phalangists massacre as many as 1,000 helpless men, women, and children. Ariel Sharon, the defense minister in charge of the occupying forces, tells a special commission he never anticipated a massacre. But from his exile in Tunisia, Yasser Arafat blames Israeli occupation troops for allowing the phalangists into the refugee camps. Responsible or not, Israeli Prime Minister Begin's government faces harsh political and moral criticism. As Beirut clears the rubble, one thing seems sadly clear. This was a war that had no winners. Even beyond the Middle East, 1982 was a time of transitions. In the middle of the Lebanese crisis, Secretary of State Alexander Haig was surprised when President Reagan accepted his threat to resign. His replacement, Richard Nixon's former Treasury Secretary, George Shultz. An uncertain era began in the Soviet Union when Leonid Brezhnev died on November 10, 18 years after becoming Communist Party head. His successor, 68-year-old Yuri Andropov, former head of the Soviet secret police. In 1982, 81-year-old William Paley announced he would step down as head of CBS, the communications empire he founded 54 years ago. On television, a host of cable networks. And the loss of a channel devoted to cultural programming. The first to go, CBS Cable. 